Good morning, everyone. My name is Pete Langley, Senior Attorney and Lobbyist here at Plunkett Cooney's Government Relations, Public Policy and Regulatory Practice Group. It's my pleasure to serve as coordinator for today's program, which is being co-sponsored by our good friends over at Gongwar News Service, Michigan's home for policy and politics. Today's discussion should be a lot of fun as we review the upcoming Michigan general election, some of the key races and the three ballot initiatives that have been making a lot of the headlines. Very excited to be joined today by three of Gong Wars' top writers on politics and policy, including Zach Gorchow, who is the executive editor and publisher at Gong War News Service Michigan. Joining Zach are Alethea Kasbin, who is the managing editor at Gong War, and staff writer Ben Solis. Welcome, everyone. Before we get started, I'd like to mention just a bit of background about myself, then I'll ask each of our guests to introduce themselves. As I mentioned, I'm a member of Plunkett Cooney's Government Relations, Public Policy, and Regulatory Compliance Practice Group. For those who don't know, Plunkett Cooney is a full service law firm with offices throughout Michigan. We also have locations in Chicago, Indianapolis, and Columbus. In the Government Relations Group, we help our clients navigate state government. We're proud to co-sponsor today's webinar and a fun Pick the Winners contest that we'll talk about more at the end of the program. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Zach and his colleagues to talk about what they do at Gongwar. Zach, let's start with you. Thanks, Pete. It's uh, great to have everyone with us this morning. Looking forward to the discussion. Uh, so I am the executive editor and publisher of Gongwar News Service. As uh, most of you probably know, we are a daily publication that covers Michigan government and politics at gongwar.com. And I'm going to turn it over to Alethea to introduce herself. Hi, everyone. I'm excited uh, to, to be here today and talk about all things elections. Uh, like was said, I am the managing editor. So I lead, um, you know, a lot of our, our news coverage, work with our reporters on various stories and, you know, get the report all set up and sent to hopefully most of you uh, every day. Um, and I will kick it over to Ben. Hey, folks. How are you? Ben Solis here, um, staff writer. Gongwer. I uh, cover the judiciary uh, primarily in the Supreme Court, as well as the Attorney General's office and uh, Michigan State Police, kind of a criminal justice beat there. But uh, over the past year, I've been covering the uh, Republican side of the governor's race, and now I'm covering the Dixon campaign primarily. So that's been my focus, and uh, I'm excited to talk about that race. Thanks, everyone. As you can see, we brought the A-team today to talk about these issues, so looking forward to the conversations. Do you have a few housekeeping items I'd like to address before we jump into the conversation? Uh, for the Q&A portion of the webinar, we're gonna use the chat function on your Zoom dashboard. Uh, take a moment right now just to take a look for it, uh, find the tool and feel free to enter questions as they occur to you during the program. At the end of the presentation, we will answer as many questions as possible. Finally, I wanna mention that today's session is being recorded and that recording will be available on the event page of Plunkett Cooney's website, which is located at plunkettcooney.com. Feel free to share the recording link with your colleagues or direct them to the event page at our site. With that, I think we paid the bills and we can dive into the discussion. Uh, certainly have plenty to talk about today uh, on these key races. Let's go ahead and start with statewide governor's race. Uh, a lot to talk about there, a lot of uh, setting the table that probably needs to be done to discuss this. Uh, Zach, Ben, what are your thoughts? Well, I think we're at a, a really interesting uh, point of the race. Uh, it has been an extraordinary situation where Governor Whitmer and her Democratic allies have really owned the airwaves, uh, really unprecedented uh, barrage of money and ads that has not been answered. Um, but that's about to at least change somewhat. Uh, the Republican Governors Association has decided to go ahead with a roughly three and a half to four million dollar buy that's going to start soon. Um, and that might be supplemented as well by uh, the Dixon, pro Dixon Super PAC, uh, we'll see, but um, they have been somewhat involved so far as well. So um, with uh, that kind of activity happening, this is what Tudor Dixon needs to at least get her base back. Um, you know, she's been struggling to even pull that together. So you know, I know Ben's been uh, following the, the Dixon campaign pretty closely. I'm curious, Ben, um, you know, what do you, what do you see the Dixon campaign trying to do right now to, to wage a viable race? 
Yeah, the the campaign uh, issue, campaign cash issue, has been uh, pretty much plaguing the the campaign since the beginning. Uh, even in the primary days, they uh, saw, you know struggled to get money together for the campaign. Um, you know what I'm seeing on the on the Republican side is that they're really focused on the economy and this education issue, primarily the sex and gender issue in education, and really um, trying to drum up whatever palpable anger against Whitmer uh, and her COVID policies, uh, really trying to hit that home. Uh, but, you know, Dixon has stepped in a few hornet's nests of her own uh, on certain issues that Democrats have closed in on, particularly her stance on abortion. Uh, and she's been kind of a, in a pattern of, of double talk recently of simultaneously double, doubling down on her, her stance while also kind of distancing herself from it, saying that this is not what the race is about. The race is about the economy for us. The race is about education for us. Um, but we know that that's probably not the case because people are pretty vote motivated to either go out and vote against the reproductive freedom uh, ballot proposal or vote for it. Um, so, you know, it's it's been interesting to see them try to wage that race uh, simply on the economy and simply on education when that abortion issue is really kind of hanging out there. And then, you know, on the um, the Whitmer side, it, it's they've really been waging a, a two front battle. Um, of course, they've emphasized um, abortion. That's been a huge focus ever since the Dobbs decision leaked in the spring, um, and the governor has um, hammered away at you know, her support for the right to illegal abortion and Dixon's position um, of uh, supporting the 1931 prohibition against abortion except to save the life of the mother. But they also realize they've got to focus on the economy as well. That is a you know, inflation is on everyone's mind. Um, supply chain shortages, uh, and so forth. So you've also seen the governor emphasizing things like the auto insurance rebate uh, and other areas where they've tried to do things on the economic front, uh, talking about different kinds of jobs that they're working to bring into the state. So you, you sense, at least from the Democratic side of the Democrats I talk to is, you know, yeah, these public polls showing a 16, 17 point lead for the governor, that's great, but no, I don't know anybody who believes this is going to end up a 16 or 17 point margin. Uh, I think most people feel like this will end up in the single digits somewhere, um, that, that Governor Whitmer is clearly the favorite right now, but the idea that this is going to turn into some sort of runaway, I, I don't know anybody who buys that. That's a good point. I think that's going to be the messaging for this uh, campaign is the polling. It is the truth. There's got to be in there somewhere between that 17 and 6%. Ben, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, to echo Zach, the uh, the polling has been somewhat contradictory at this point. Of course, we saw all these early polls that showed, you know, this double digit lead for Whitmer. Uh, the latest CBS poll shows that Dixon might be in a little bit more of a of striking distance with a little bit more than five percentage points of, of a gap between her and the incumbent governor. But, um, you know, the campaign does not seem to view this as a disadvantage, but is rather touting it as, look, we're gaining steam uh, and closing in. Um, that's tough to say because, you know, her increase in polling, if that does continue and, uh, you know, Whitmer's polling stays stagnant, it just shows that the, the Dixon base is kind of just coalescing even further around her. Um, but, you know, they're really using this as kind of a chip on the shoulder motivation to get out there and continue doing what they're doing. Um, whether they truly believe that or not, it's, it's anyone's guess, but th that's been the public face of the campaign of saying, we're the underdog, we're proud of that, and uh, we're going to keep on striking until we get the, the, the lead in the polls. You know, if you look at some of those public polls, you know, Dixon is down in the low 30% range. I, I mean, look. It, I think there's a big problem is there's lower information Republican voters don't even know who their nominee is because there hasn't been, you know, advertising and mail to get that base activated. The Republican base in the state is somewhere between 41 and 44 percent, somewhere in that range. And, you know, eventually those voters, or at least most of them, are likely to come home. Um, there, there is some evidence, uh, I think, in, in Detroit News poll that suggests um, very soft Republican women are not on board because of the abortion issue, and that could be a problem for Dixon. But you know, get ready if you know once these ads start running, 
you know, the next round of polls, it's going to be closer. You can pretty much guarantee it and get ready for a round of, you know, Dixon surging stories, which is really not accurate. It's really um, that she's finally getting her base consolidated uh, and so forth. You know, if yes, if Whitmer's numbers fall from the high 40s near 50 into the mid to low 40s, then yes, we're going to have a real race for sure. But if it suddenly changes from Whitmer 49, Dixon 32 to Whitmer 49, Dixon 42, you know, I, I don't necessarily see that as, you know, great news for Dixon because Whitmer still has a very short runway uh, to get to that victory margin. Do you think that the Whitmer campaign is at all concerned that they've done more to help Tudor Dixon's name ID with some of the advertising they've done than, than the candidate herself has done for, you know, for her own campaign? I don't think so. I mean, and the, the polling that's out there doesn't suggest that's been a problem. I mean, I think this is what you want to do when you have an overwhelming financial advantage. You want to define your opponent before they can define themselves. And they have really, you know, they have sought to do that and basically say Tudor Dixon is the, can is the candidate of never abortion, essentially, is what they have tried to do. Um, we'll find out how successful that's been. But if you have the opportunity to define your opponent and they have no ability to define themselves, you do it. Um, even if it means running the risk of uh, introducing them in some way. If you can introduce them in a negative way, I think you, you take that chance. Okay. Well, it's interesting you say that too, Zach, and, and you bring that up, Pete, is that um, you know the Dixon campaign does not feel that way, though. Uh, at the Ask Me Anything um, pout hall that she had on Friday, uh, she did bring up that specific point of saying, you know, we're not on the airwaves and people have said, I don't have any name IDs. Well, Gretchen Whitmer has done that for me. Now people know who I am because of her ads. Um, so, I mean, yeah, obviously they want to get out there and, and, and compete on the airwaves, get their own messaging across and their own, you know, positive ads out there to frame Dixon as, as a candidate and define her. But they are, you know, somewhat convinced that say, hey, you know, people know who we are now because of all those negative ads and people who do not agree with Whitmer or are planning to vote against her um, are seeing that and getting that name, you know, embedded in their heads. So that's kind of an interesting aspect. It just takes me back to the uh, old Supreme Court race, the Taylor Markman and Young campaign, where uh, the Democrats were running uh, the anti incumbent uh, names over and over and over again. And it ended up being people couldn't remember exactly what they thought about them, but they could remember the name because of the jingle that went along with it. So I think it'll be interesting and, and see how that, uh, when we debrief on this campaign, how that ends up looking. Yeah, I, you know, that was, you know, a big difference, of course, between a Supreme Court race where the, you know, even the incumbents are, you know, everyone's pretty well, you know, not well known at all uh, in the governor's race. But, you know, the, look, if this ends up being really close, um, you know, much closer than expected right now. There will be a lot of things looked at as to what happened. You know, I, I mentioned we're at an interesting point. You know, we've got our first debate uh, between the candidates is coming up on Thursday. Um, this is, this is in my mind, Tudor Dixon's best shot. You know, that first debate is always the one that seems to have the most resonance. You know, it's finally going to be her chance to introduce herself to a statewide audience. You know, the ads that have run so far can't really feature her, you know, in a direct way talking to the camera because they're all from outside groups. Um, so this is going to be her chance to look, you know, into the camera, look voters in the eye, so to speak, and make the case for why she should replace Gretchen Whitmer as governor. Um, you know, she's going to, you know, she's going to have her hands full. She, you know, Gretchen Whitmer is a skilled debater. She's been through this multiple times. Um, and, you know, you know that the Democrats have been preparing for the, you know, Tudor Dixon to throw at the kitchen sink at the governor on Thursday, because, you know, Tudor Dixon has nothing to lose. Everyone expects her to lose, um, you know, maybe by a lot. So she's going to, you know, that's green in some ways as a candidate, I think. Uh, she can take some chances um, and see what, uh, see if she can uh, land some punches. Uh, and, and a lot of people seem to be invoking uh, former Governor John Engler and, and how, you know, he was down in the polls when he first ran and uh, that there's the opportunity to come back. And I think that those are some pretty big shoes to try and fill and the expectations are, uh, you know, have got to be uh, upon uh, Tudor Dixon to try and uh, get some momentum going. So it'll be interesting to see the, uh, 
the, the debates and it'll be interesting to see the gong we're right up the morning after to see what uh, uh, what your internal thoughts were on those as well all right with that i think we've exhausted a little bit on the governor let's uh let's go ahead and start talking about some of the senate races uh and zach and alethea i think uh it'd be helpful for uh, you two to set the table a little bit about uh, what races are, are key and what it means and, and what the statewide uh, perception is right now on, on the Senate seats. Well, maybe I'll just give a quick overview, a very quick overview on the Senate and Alethea will do a quick overview on, on the House. Um, just about everyone we talk to says the Senate is a jump ball right now as far as control of the Senate. Republicans have had control since 1984. Democrats, really only came close, come close once since then in 2006. Um, but it's, it's really up for grabs. You know, each party can lay claim to about 16 seats each that they can feel pretty good about. Um, and it's those last six uh, where this is gonna be decided. Uh, you know, if you're the Democrats, because the governor is the favorite, uh, that means the Lieutenant Governor would break the tie and so you probably feel a little better that you only need to get to 19 maybe. Republicans may need to get to 20, assuming Governor Whitmer wins re-election. But, you know, I don't think anybody has a good feel for what's going to happen. If I'm a Republican, what I feel good about, and we'll get into this a little more in a minute, is a lot of the turf, you know, really three of the key races have Macomb County as a significant component. And if I'm a Republican, I feel pretty good about waging battles in Macomb County. Alicia, what do you think on the House real quick? Um, so the House is a little bit different um you know it's more of a republican edge for the house you know they've had majority since 2010 and there's just way more seats um at play here and once you have all the toss-ups or i mean all of the safe democratic seats go to the dems safe republican seats go to the republicans it's a shorter path for the republicans to get to majority and there's just pockets of sort of areas of competitiveness that have that are just very different. So you have a cluster of seats in Grand Rapids, um, where um, you know the message from Republicans might not hit as well. Um, they sort of were able to uh, face the the economic uncertainty, especially with COVID, and now with inflation, a little bit better than say folks in Grand or in Down River, where we have another pocket of competitive seats. So, um, you know, I could see Democrats doing well in Grand Rapids with voters there kind of, you know, turning against Trump. They have a congressional candidate who, um, you know, comes from the Trump world and that can kind of drive Republicans down there, but they could make it up and down river. There's a couple of open seats or one incumbent and then another open seat in Oakland where Democrats definitely need to make a play. We'll talk about those races here in a little bit. Uh, but I would give, you know, Republicans the edge there. And then you get to sort of Northern Michigan and the UP where Republicans, you know, have pretty much dominated. Um, and it just, it's a tougher path for the Dems here. And you see that with, you know, a lot of the focus from national groups on the Senate. Um, but I do think it's at play. The environment is very conflicting as, you know, we have written about, uh, you have abortion and the economy as a top issue. So you could argue that, you know, Dems can win on the abortion issue Republicans can win on the economy. Um, you know, what do voters do with that? <laughs> These are two very, you know, conflicting things. But Democrats do say that they're running an economic message as well. You know, they're talking about, you know, different things. Governor Whitmer has proposed, um, you know, earned income tax credit, pension tax repeal, auto insurance. You know, they say we have an economic message too. But does it really resonate when, you know, the party in power in Washington are the Democrats? You know, do voters kind of tie um, all of the economic turmoil, you know, to, you know, the Democratic Party. So there's a lot of questions and we'll just have to see how, how it all shakes out next month. Yeah, and that, uh, so we could, I guess, kick it off with that ninth Senate district. So uh, this is a district uh, that is an open seat with no incumbent. A lot of it is currently represented by Mallory McMorrow, but she's in a new district now. So you've got Troy, Rochester Hills, and a big piece of Sterling Heights, which is where the bulk of this population is. Uh, the Democratic nominee is Padma Koopa. She's a state representative who represents Troy. And the Republican nominee is Michael Weber, who's a uh, former Republican state representative um, from Rochester Hills, also a former member of the Rochester Hills City Council. You know, this was a race at the beginning, you know, when the lines were drawn and candidates announced, I really expected 
would be an all out battle. We have it currently classified as a toss up. Um, but right now it seems to be advantage Weber. Um, Senate Democrats are pouring money into so many seats in a way they've never done before, but not in this race. For whatever reason, they, they just not don't seem to see the same opportunity here as they do in other districts. Um, you know, that could be a variety of reasons, uh, but, you know, on, on balance, you'd say you've got Troy, you've got Rochester and Rochester Hills here. This is an area where the abortion decision in Dobbs could be really big. Um, but for whatever reason, that doesn't, we haven't seen a big emphasis on that from Padma Cooper. And the Senate Democrats have not gone on to broadcast television there like they have in other seats. I, it, I still feel this you know, is up for grabs, but I, you'd have to put a little bit of money on Weber right now simply because there's no real major Democratic investment going in. Um, that being said, uh, Troy has certainly shifted to be a very Democratic city. I think what Republicans feel good about is the swing community here is Rochester Hill. And that is Michael Weber's home turf. Um, so if he runs better than your garden variety Republican there, uh, that makes it difficult for Padma Cooper because Sterling Heights is trending Republican. Uh, that's an area where Michael Weber should do well. There's also a bit of Oakland Township in here, which is a very, very high income area and, and pretty solidly Republican. Uh, so, you know, it's going to be a, a, an interesting outcome here. Uh, if this one does end up going to the Republicans, uh, it certainly makes the Democratic path to 19 or 20 seats more difficult, but not certainly not impossible. Right now, I don't think they're counting on it. To get to. I, I think that's an interesting point. I, 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 emphasizing a couple of things you said earlier, which is I think Democrats wanted more seats in play in Oakland County and Republicans wanted more seats in play out of Macomb County. And, and here, this is really the only one that's got in Oakland County uh, presence. And it doesn't seem to be going the way that uh, uh, folks had uh, thought it was going to be this this huge battle, and it doesn't seem to be trending that way right now. No, it does not. Um, and you know, the, I think the Sterling Heights piece really seems to have scared off the Democrats in some ways. You know, if this district had been designed a little differently, um, with no Macomb in it and more Oakland, it, it'd probably be a different story. But Sterling Heights is uh, is Trump country, and. Uh, it's going to make Koopa's task very difficult. Interesting. Well, let's go to the 11th district, which is Macomb, Wayne County, and we've got uh, incumbent Senator Michael McDonald versus Veronica Kleinfeld. Alethea, what are your what are your thoughts on this area? So Senator McDonald here lost, you know, a big chunk of, of his hometown in this district, and it sort of moved south and got some more, you know, um, Democratic centered communities. So he is certainly in a little bit of trouble here. Both sides seem to be pretty much all in. Veronica Kleinfeld is a Macomb County Commissioner. So she has, you know, name ID. She, you know, is known. She's not, you know, a, a nobody candidate. Um, and, you know, she's emphasizing abortion. Republicans, you know, are attacking her on some, some votes that she took as a commissioner or as a local official. Um, so, you know, they're, they're both pulling their punches, but I think, you know, Dems have, a bit of an edge here, even with, you know, Senator McDonald's incumbency. He's also, you know, kind of a quiet member. Uh, you know, he kind of puts his head down and does the work, which, you know, could be helpful or hurtful, um, yeah. depending on how you look at it. You know, he's not out there, you know, throwing bombs uh, and turning off voters, but he also might not be, you know, the the loudest, you know, incumbent um, to, to really take advantage of, of having that designation. And, and I think this has kind of been a little bit of surprise being, you know, Macomb County and again, the, the trends of what's going on there and the, the base of how well, you know, Trump did there, uh, but certainly uh, getting a lot of headlines and, and will make for an interesting one. Um, now, I don't know if it's as interesting as the next race we're going to talk about, which is kind of the battle of the giants here, the, the 12th district, which is Macomb, St. Clair and Wayne County. And this is the uh, rep Kevin Hertel versus rep Pam, Pamela Hornberger, which uh, seems to be, by all accounts, a bare knuckle brawl at this point, um, uh, and, and a lot of interest and intense uh, focus being put on this seat. Um, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, so I think you know, much like the Senate overall, this one is a jump ball. Uh, you know, this one is you know certainly crucial for for majority. 
you have Brett Pertel, who you know obviously is is very well known. He's you know certainly well seasoned in campaigns, has helped run you know the House campaign operations in the past, uh, and he is you know out there on TV on doors doing all the things, just like Representative Hornberger, who is in leadership in the House um, and has you know a lot to run on as well. They're both running maybe slightly truthfully questionable ads against each other. So they're definitely um, going going all in on that front. That's um, the county though, right? I mean, that's right. you, you expect that uh, that to happen every now and then. Yeah, you know, if one side does it, the other side can, and then there it just spirals out of control, right? Um, but on paper, you know, this, you know, should should tilt Republican, but I think, you know, with, with Representative Fertel and his experience and his uh, name in the district, he can might be wiping a little bit of that that tilt Republican and making it more of a 50-50 seat. And this one, you know, will go down to the very end. I think, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we see this as one of the most expensive, you know, races when it comes down to the end with both caucuses putting, you know, everything they can and more into it. I'd like to see the door count at the end of this race to see how many folks, how many doors were hit, how many times. Uh, it's not going to be for lack of access that people don't know who to vote for in this one. They, I think they've got access and they've got information from both sides. And, and my guess is they're, they're going to hit the district multiple times by the time this thing gets done in November. Yeah, for sure. I mean, neither of these candidates are you know, taking the, their first run at this. I think they, they know what they're doing. Um, so yeah, it won't be for lack of, of effort. That's for sure. Outstanding. Uh, let's take a look up at the 35th district. That's Bay County, Midland County, and Saginaw County. And that's got current rep uh, Annette Glenn versus Kristen McDonald Rivet. Uh, Zach, uh, what are your thoughts on this? This is, um, I mean, without question, one of the most important races for the Senate for a variety of reasons. The redistricting commission drew this district with a purpose. Uh, they combined Bay City, Midland, and the city of Saginaw to create a tri cities district part of the whole communities of interest movement. And it's a 50-50 district. Uh, in fact, both parties would probably put the base numbers at about 50% Dem, 48% Republican. Um, so, you know, a flip a coin kind of scenario. Um, I was actually up in that district uh, last night uh, moderating a candidate debate between the two or a forum between the two. And, you know, these are two very skilled candidates. Uh, you know, Annette Glenn has been through um, some tough races, both for herself um, and for her husband, you know, former Rep. Gary Glenn. Uh, Krista McDonald Rivet is you know, quite experienced in state government herself, um, and she's got a lot of family links into politics. She knows uh, what races, you know, these races are all about, and uh, they both, you know, are pushing very hard. A ton of money is being spent uh, in this district. Um, it's a fully engaged, for sure. It's one of those where it really, in the end, I feel like is a turnout game. Um, you know, for McDonald Rivet to win, she's going to need a very strong turnout out of the city of Saginaw, um, and that is, you know, always in question. Uh, you know, will Saginaw, specifically Black voters in Saginaw, uh, who tend to vote heavily Democratic, come out in big numbers? She's got to have that. Um, for Annette Glenn, you know, she had some pro she's had some problems in her hometown of Midland in the past. When she first ran for the House in 2018, she actually lost the city of Midland um, to the Democratic candidate that year. The Glens have been a bit polarizing uh, because of their views on social issues. She did win Midland when she ran for re-election in 2020, but she's got to do better than that. You know, she needs to, to win Midland by a decent margin. Um, it is a city, it, the city proper has been moving a little more Democratic. In recent years, Glenn needs to, to put that down. And then McDonald Rivet needs to stop the Democratic leading in, in Bay County. Uh, that's an area that has been moving Republican very quickly, and she's got to find a way to arrest that damage. So a lot of moving pieces in this district. I don't think anybody knows for sure what's going to happen. Um, but you know, I, I feel pretty confident that whoever wins this district, whichever party wins it, is going to control the Senate. That's an interesting perspective. And, and with these two candidates, you've got people that have got uh, commitment to public service and community engagement and community outreach. I mean, they seem to have pretty good uh, uh, grassroots efforts, brass tops, and, and, and putting in the work as well. Yeah, you know, it, it was interesting to hear, you know, we, I, I asked them both a question about working with the other side, you know, that to be a successful legislator, you have to be able to work with both sides. 
And they both were ready uh, with uh, a variety of you know, examples of how they've done that uh, through their career. So you've got two you know, pretty polished, uh, well-prepared candidates who know how to give and take a punch. And uh, I, it feels like this one really will go down to the wire um, and there's gonna be just an enormous amount of money spent on it. Well, outstanding. So the advertisers are gonna do well this, uh, this <laughs> cycle, yeah. it seems like. <laughs> well, let's turn our attention to the state house and we've got eight races there to spend a little bit of time on. Um, Alethea, I'm going to start with you on the 29th and 31st district. Both of those uh, have portions of beautiful Monroe County. Uh, the 29th has got some Wayne County in there. And then the 31st has got uh, Lenaway, Wayne, and Washtenaw. And the 29th, it's incumbent rep uh, Alex Garza and, and James DeSanta. And then in the 31st, you've got Dale Benicki and uh, Reggie Miller. Let's start out with the 29th. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so these are, you know, two of the, the four downriver seats that, you know, are, are really a key area for, for both sides uh, next month. So Rep Garza uh, went from, you know, having, with redistricting, went from having a seat that was pretty safe in the, the Democratic column to uh, a very competitive seat. Um, so he is in a little bit of a tough spot. Republicans, you know, feel really good here. Uh, James DeSena has, you know, some family history um, with with politics. Um, so he he is well known, and uh, the Democrat or the Republicans really feel like their message um, resonates the most in these downriver districts. I think they think that they can win on the issues, talking about the economy and inflation and tying that to the Dems. Um, and you see that too here with the, the Dem ads, you know, they are talking about abortion, um, but they all are so, they are also saying things like, we want to fund the police. We want to keep communities safe. Uh, we want to spend your dollars judiciously in Lansing and lower the gas tax. So these are all things Dems are saying in their ad as well. So I think the, the question here is if, you know, Republicans can um, successfully paint the Dems as the problem with the economy, even though they're saying, you know, we do have, you know, our own solutions. Um, so Democrats want to hold on to the seat. They know that it's tough. Um, they do have, you know, the the power of incumbency, but it's also a different district. So that might not, you know, go as far. Um, and 31 is an open seat. So moving on to, to that one. So Reggie Miller is a, a Van Buren Township trustee and Dale Benecki is a retired truck driver. Uh, Republicans really like Dale. They, you know, were, were working to recruit him for a while. And this was, was the year that he, he would run. Um, but, you know, Reggie Miller has that you know, township experience. So she is also, um, you know, maybe slightly more well-known. So this is kind of putting, uh, you know, sort of a, a man of the people, so to speak, against, you know, a township official um, and sort of a lot of the same themes that we see in 29 in terms of ads, you know, a little bit of talk about abortion, but also a lot of talk about the economy and, you know, what either candidate is going to do um, you know, to bring down prices or make things better. Um, and, you know, it, who's going to win is, is really unknown, but these two plus the two others are, are really important for whatever side, you know, wants to get majority of the house. Um, and, you know, if, if one side sweeps them, I would be surprised. I think they'll, they'll be split up a little bit and we'll just have to see. Whenever I think of this area, I, I think of it being Trump country and Dingo country and, and, as it always turns out, it, it seems like the candidate that the voter would most like to have a beer with is the one that ends up winning in, in these types of seats. And, and it's always been kind of interesting where um, they are much more candidate focused than they are on the partisan politics in, in, uh, in the split in this area. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I should have mentioned, um, you know, the Trump factor here. Like it's not, uh, it doesn't hurt the Republicans the way it might in a different area. So that, you know, is a big advantage for them. But it's also an area where Representative Camilleri, a Democrat, you know, was able to win even as, you know, Trump was on the ballot and, um, you know, did well. So it, it's really, um, it's kind of like, I think the way you describe it is quite good, the candidate that they want to get a beer with. So I think that's part of the reason Republicans feel so good in 31 is may, they are expecting voters here, you know, would rather, you know, get a beer with the retired truck driver versus the, the township trustee. Interesting. I look forward to these, uh, these results as well. 
Uh, Zach, let's go down to the 38th district or over to the 38th district. That's Allegan, Berrien, and Van Buren counties. And we've got Joey Andrews versus Kevin Whiteford, who's the husband of, of sitting state rep Mary Whiteford. Um, this one is this one's kind of getting bare knuckles over in the house as well. How's it looking from your perspective? I mean, this is probably the most pure coin flip toss-up seat in the house uh, for a variety of reasons. But I think the biggest one is just look at the, the design of the district. Um, the joke is the, the stairway to the Lakeshore district. Um, the communities of interest component again, linking every community basically from Niles up to Saugatuck. Um, you want to talk about um, you know, an interesting group of communities. You've got everything from solidly democratic cities like Benton Harbor and Benton Township to uh, really solid Republican areas like Lincoln Township and Berrien County. And then you've got, you know, kind of tourist towns that lean Democratic like uh, Saugatuck and South Haven other Republican townships in between. So it's a real mix. No one has any idea how this district is gonna perform from a partisan standpoint. Uh, these communities have never been linked together. Um, so it, it's, it, again, this one is a real key seat uh, to whichever party is gonna to get to 56. Now, one thing that's helping the Republicans here is, um, unlike in a lot of other races where their candidates are cash poor, uh, Kevin Whiteford has, you know, substantial personal resources he can bring to bear in this race. So that was a big relief to the Republicans, uh, knowing that, you know, he'd be able to, to fund a campaign. Um, uh, Joey Andrews over on the other side uh, is a uh, lawyer, uh, works uh, in the AFL-CIO, um, and was able to win a, a tough Democratic primary on his side, uh, and has done a good job of fundraising himself. Uh, it, it's, you know, again, this is a really hard to predict one. You know, one of the advantages Kevin Whiteford might have had uh, being the husband of an incumbent is gone because almost all of Mary Whiteford's district is elsewhere. It's in another area. So he can't draw upon the same array of connections uh, and uh, walk lists and so forth that uh, Mary Whiteford would have been able to use. So um, flip a coin, we'll see what happens. Uh, I, I wouldn't really want to put any money either way on this one. It's probably safe to say, too, that short-term rentals is the number one issue for this district, uh, uh, given the way that it looks and, and, and those types of communities. Well, I will say, I, you know, I'm not going to say I, I know for sure all the, the individual issues that are resonating, but that, that certainly would be uh, right for being one of those, uh, one of those issues. Um, but again, you know, this is one where the, the basic structure is still there. Um, you still got abortion is a key issue for the Democrats to use. Uh, and you've got the economy being a key one uh, for the Republicans. So that overlay is still there, but you're right. Um, there are certainly some specific issues that will come into play here. Water clearly is going to be big. That's usually been an issue that's worked well for the Democrats. Um, Short-term rental uh, being another. Um, the economy takes on even greater importance here because of tourism. So you think about the hospitality industry, which was hit so hard during COVID. That's got to be a big factor here as well. Outstanding. Let's go to the 44th district. That's uh, Calhoun County, the Battle Creek area, where you've got Rep. Uh, Jim Hadzma versus Dave Morgan. Alethea, what are your thoughts? So, you know, this district didn't change too much in redistricting. Um, Representative Hadzma is running for his third term. So it'll be his third go around against Dave Morgan, who you know has has lost twice and is now running a third time. So I'm a little bit uh, jaded with this seat. I don't know how much has really changed that Dave Morgan can make you know a true play here. But with that said, he did come pretty close in 2020 without really spending or seemingly doing anything. So you know maybe this is the time that that he breaks through. This is you know this is a tough district for for the Dems. You know, they they didn't have it uh, before Representative Hodzma won it, so they were able to flip it with him, and he's, you know, been able to, to hold on. Um, I, you know, think it'll be a tough race again. It'll be a close race again, but Representative Hodzma knows that. He knows, you know, he votes strategically. You know that he's working, um, so I give the edge to him at this point, but, you know, it is it is a tough seat. So Republicans always could make a play here and be successful. Uh, and that, you know, it's just 
it's unclear if there's really that much that's different, you know, between the last, you know, two cycles with Dave Morgan as their candidate, if he can really, you know, make gains or, you know, they need to wait until this one is open to get, you know, a better candidate in there. Yeah, well, in the lay of the land, the mix of uh, the urban and rural here uh, makes it uh, makes it interesting. But yeah, I, 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 I've heard a lot of the same things on there. Uh, both good candidates, a lot of work going on. Um, but yeah, we'll just see what happens this year. All right, Zach, 54th and 55th, both, both in Oakland County. Uh, the 54th, we got Donnie Steele versus uh, Shadia Martini. And then in the 55th, you've got incumbent rep Mark Tisdale versus Patricia Bernard. Uh, and my apologies if I butchered any of those names, but uh, let's start with the 54th, Zach. So this is really, you know, these two seats, are pretty close to ground zero along with Kent County for the Democrats. They, they've got to find a way to win both these races if they wanna to get to 56. These are areas that are, are trending their way and they gotta capitalize on it. Um, so this 54th district is a new district, no incumbent. Again, these communities have never been joined. You've got Orion Township, which would be the Republican component of the seat. Uh, you've got Northern Bloomfield Township, Bloomfield Hills, uh, trending Democratic area, and then you've got part of Auburn Hills, which is fairly Democratic in this seat. Um, you know, I think this was a bit of a surprise on the Democratic side in the primary. They had a, a township trustee from Bloomfield Township who lost to Shadia Martini, who actually ran for a different seat uh, well south of here two years ago in the Democratic primary and lost to Kyra Harris Bolden. Uh, now she's running for this one. Um, and you've got Donnie Steele, who's on the Orion Township board. Um, Republicans were very relieved she came through their primary. There was an election denier uh, uh, on, in that primary who Steele was able to defeat. Um, again, a, a real coin flip type race. Um, being Oakland County, this is one where you know Dobbs and abortion, key issue for the Democrats. Um, this is really just going to come down to how much has this part of Oakland County changed? If you look at that map, you can see M59 there cutting right through the middle of Auburn Hills. And the general consensus about Oakland County right now is, yes, you know, south of M59, it's really become strongly Democratic for the most part. But north of M59 is still very much the Oakland County people remember uh, from yesteryear. It's still a very solidly Republican area. So the question is, how much does Dobbs turn things. Um, you know, a Donnie Steele win here really put, it, it becomes very hard to see how the Democrats get to, to 56. You know, moving over to 55, you know, six, seven months ago, I would have said, this is not a competitive race. Mark Tisdell is going to win. You know, he was on the Rochester Hills City Council. The district is almost entirely made up of the Rochesters. There's a little bit of Oakland Township in there too. Um, he won a tough race in 2020. Rochester, Rochester Hills, this area, this is Swing District Central. Um, if you think about the old version of this district, which is very similar to the new one, carried by Joe Biden, carried by John James, carried by Alyssa Slotkin, and won by Mark Tisdell. I mean, talk about uh, you know voters looking at the candidate, this is that area. So I felt Tisdell came into this you know, as the candidate to beat for sure, but everything changed with Dobbs. This is, you know, ground zero for that uh, socially liberal, liberal, fiscally conservative, independent, soft Republican swing voter. Um, and, you know, the Democrats have been all in here now. Uh, this is a, very much a race. Patricia Bernard is a newcomer. She's worked in the nonprofit world. Um, you know, we don't know a lot about her in terms of her being a strong campaigner. She did win. A Democratic primary and, and beat a candidate who had some endorsements from the traditional Democratic power base. Um, you know, but she's going to need a lot of investment from outside Democratic groups. Mark Tisdell's got a lot of money. The Republicans are going to put everything they have into keeping him. Um, again, a Tisdell win here uh, makes it, you know, pretty difficult for Democrats to get to 56. You know, they need to take, the Dems need to, to consolidate in Oakland County. Uh, and if they can't, if they can't win here, how powerful is Dobbs and the abortion issue really? Because this is the kind of seat where it should turn a race. If it's going to turn a race, this is the one it should turn. If it doesn't, it's probably not making a difference in many other legislative races. 
So just like most years, uh, Oakland County is going to be a, a big indicator for the state and, and the politics moving forward, which I think is a, is a good perspective. Um, you know, turning next to the 58th district, which is Macomb County, you've got an incumbent uh, in Rep. Nate Shannon versus Michelle Smith. And I would imagine this is a Macomb seat that, that the Democrats probably are concerned about. Yeah, so, you know, Rep. Shannon is another Democratic incumbent who is in, you know, a tough district. He, you know, has been, is, he's running for his third term. So his, he's been in a tough district, you know, for, for the entire time he's been in the House. But he's kind of gotten a little bit lucky in the sense that Republicans didn't have uh, top tier candidates his first you know two runs in, in 2020 they had a candidate um, that the HRCC actually came out and said you know we're not backing this candidate anymore after you know he had made a joke about the the kidnapper plot against Governor Whitmer and kind of downplayed that so they completely just said you know we're out we're not you know playing in the seat anymore it's different this year Michelle Smith um, is a, a good candidate for the Republicans they really like her and you know they feel like Republicans win in Macomb. So they think they have a, a good shot at um, taking out Representative Shannon. But at the same time, you know, Rep Shannon, much like Representative Hodsma, you know, he votes strategically, he's working in the district, you know, he's doing all the things that he should be doing. Um, and it really just comes down to the numbers game, who comes out, uh, can you know, Republicans kind of make the push here? Does you know the abortion issue? kind of tamper down maybe the economic message that, you know, absent the Dobbs decision, I think would be putting Representative Shannon completely underwater at this point. So this is another one where you're, we're going to see sort of a, a battle of the, the competing factors and we'll just, you know, we'll, we'll find out at the end which ones come through. Um, you know, I think this is going to be, you know, a very tight race that goes down to the wire. And I think, part of the underlying conversation that goes into a lot of these seats, and in particular looking at the, the map on this one, uh, is the Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission. It doesn't look like they did any favors to Rep. Shannon with this seat. It, this looks more like a Picasso rather than a, a, a nice finely tuned uh, uh, box or square. Um, and, but you see that in a whole bunch of different seats. It, these are the first that we're working with these lines. How much of a how much of a, a wild card factor is that in your estimation? Well, it just makes it hard, you know, to to know historically, you know, how how do voters turn out in these areas, you know, and fitting them together, you know, do we have Dem pockets that you know overtake the Republican pockets? You know, we can kind of look at um, you know cities and and areas and try to put that together, but until we really see how these districts. Uh, really come together and how voters really come out. It's just, it's all a guessing game more than, more than usual. Outstanding. So the last house district we're going to talk about is over in Kent County, and, and this is the 83rd house district. It's got Lisa DeKrieger versus John Fitzgerald, which has got a, uh, the Fitzgerald name is a long heralded name in Michigan politics, and, and uh, this is part of that lineage. Zach, uh, what's a little bit of that background? Well, his, um, father was uh, the late representative and former insurance commissioner, uh, Frank Fitzgerald. Um, hopefully I can get this right. I believe his grandfather is the former governor, also Frank Fitzgerald, and his great grandfather, I'm going to say, admit, I don't remember exactly what he did, but was a major elected official in Michigan as well. So there's, there's a lot of tradition there. Um, you know, Kent County is so important this year uh, after what the redistricting commission did. And um, there's, really four, you could say, swing districts there. But this is the one that is the most up for grabs and, and probably the hardest to get for the Democrats. It's still sort of hard for me to believe that Wyoming, which used to be the bastion of, of social conservatism, uh, produced legislators like the Borgieses and so forth, is now a purple community. It, it, it's a 50-50 community. Um, so this district has Wyoming and a little bit of Grand Rapids. Um, the part of Grand Rapids that has uh, a pretty substantial Hispanic population. And it's uh, very much up for grabs. Um, you know, John Fitzgerald's on the Wyoming uh, City Council. Uh, Lisa DeKrieger is a uh, business owner. And uh, both parties are all in on the seat. You know, it pretty much feels like if the Dems can get this one, they're going to get probably all four of those Kent seats. Uh, and that would go a long way toward getting them toward 56. 
Um, you know, Fitzgerald, one of the issues he has to deal with is while he was on the Wyoming City Council, he did vote to establish a city income tax, which voters then torched, rejected overwhelmingly. So that's been an issue he's had to deal with. Um, but again, like so much of Kent County, um, abortion is a huge issue here um, that, that Democrats are emphasizing. Another piece to watch here, too, is um, the uh, problems the Republicans have had in the congressional race in this area. Um, there hasn't been nearly as much investment by Republican interests as Democrats. And so I think there's some concern among the Republicans about you know, making sure their voters come out. Uh, but this is, I think this is definitely a coin flip type race uh, down to the wire. And that'd be interesting if, if the Dems picked up all of those seats in Kent County, that would uh, flip traditional wisdom on its head and kind of make for a, an interesting new dynamic. Um, so let's go on uh, two things. One, if you've got any questions, we're, we're done covering the legislative races right now. If you have any questions, please feel free to throw them up in the chat function and we'll get to it here in just a minute. But I want to go through the ballot proposals and let's Let's spend uh, a minute talking about them and more importantly, their probably their impact on the election in general and what they're going to do. Um, proposal one is the voters for transparency and term limits. It changes term limits to maximum of 12 years served and mandates state elected officials disclose personal finances. Uh, Zach, what uh, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I think it has you know, a decent shot of passing. There doesn't seem to be any kind of really well-organized opposition. And by that, I mean, you know, there, there doesn't seem to be any money being spent to tell people to vote no. And uh, that's always a big, a big advantage, obviously, to the yes side, because it's generally all it takes is some no votes or some no ads, and it's pretty easy to pile up no votes on a proposal people don't have a gut feeling about. Um, so, you know, you've got the new, you know, big newspapers have endorsed it. That's usually helpful on a low profile ballot proposal uh, toward getting it over the finish line. And the yes side does have some money uh, to spend on advertising. So I'd say, you know, it's got a decent shot. I don't think it's going to really affect the structures of the overall election in general. Um, but I know it's clearly something everyone within the Lansing Beltway is watching very, very closely because of the term limits change. Well, it seems like it should have the biggest impact on the legislature moving forward for sure. But in terms of getting out the vote, I don't see this one as having a huge impact. People people aren't going to come uh, to the polls because of this one over uh, the other issues around there. Is that fair to say? Oh, I agree. I think it's a, this is pretty quiet stuff. All right. Let's take a look at proposal two: promote the vote 2022. Creates a fundamental right to vote, allows absentee ballots to count if received within six days after the election day and postmarked by election day, and enables the use of affidavit instead of photo identification at the polls. Uh, Alethea or Zach, thoughts? Yeah, so I think you know this one is relatively quiet as well. Um, you know that we have some some pro Prop Two ads out there, but there's also not you know a um, organized no campaign that's out there, you know spending tons of money telling people to vote no on this. And with, you know, a lot of the um, issues we've had around the election and false claims of fraud, you know, I think this has, you know, a, a very solid shot of passing. You know, the other things that are in this, um, you know, sort of codifies or puts into the constitution, you know, the how the board of state canvassers needs to act, you know, to try to take away some of concern about, you know, not certifying an election in the future. Um, you know, I think these are our points that, you know, a, a good amount of voters probably want to make sure is solidified. Um, and, you know, with, I know we'll talk about proposal three in a minute, but it just seems like that is taking all of the oxygen out of the room. And these other two proposals, you know, are, are relatively quiet. Um, I've heard Prop 2 is polling really well, so I think it will pass, but it's just not, uh, you know, getting the same amount of energy, I think, as, um, you know, with abortion on the ballot. So let's go ahead and talk about the 800 pound gorilla, which is proposal three, uh, the reproductive freedom for all, which makes abortion legal under Michigan law. Um, this is the one that, that, that seems to have the biggest impact. This is the one that everybody's talking about and um, neither side of the aisle can get away from having to take a position on this or have a conversation about this. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so this is where, this is where all the money is going. <laughs> this is where the, you know, the no campaign um, is really showing up. So, 
you know, there's definitely a lot of spending against this. Um, and, you know, as I'm sure we have all have seen, it's not so much saying, you know, abortion shouldn't be legal. It's saying this proposal is too confusing. It's too broad. You know, a ton of laws will um, fall to the wayside if this passes, including parental consent, which I think is, is the biggest one, um, you know, and allowing abortion up until birth and those kinds of things are, are what the, the no side is is pointing to, um, you know, I don't know that those will really resonate. Um, I feel like this has a, a very good shot at passing even with an organized no campaign. Uh, and in terms of how this, you know, is affecting the election, I mean, I think, you know, as we talked about in the beginning, you can see this, um, you know, it's taking center focus in the governor's race with Tudor Dixon saying, you know, abortion isn't an issue, that abortion is its own separate thing that you can vote on in the ballot. Like, let's focus on, uh, you know, candidate to candidate issues in the governor's race. So I think you probably see Republicans trying to take that route um, in, in their own races as well, hoping that, you know, if voters can vote on abortion separately, maybe they won't tie me into that issue and I won't get caught up in that because they can still vote for me and vote for abortion. Doesn't seem to be a whole lot of undecideds on this one. And it seems to, to be the kind of thing that ruins a lot of family dinners, uh, 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 when, when you get together like that, just uh, there's not a lot of people that keep their opinions to themselves on this one. They share them and, and they seem very passionate on both sides. It, it, it's one of those things that's uh, ripe for a proposal, a ballot, a ballot proposal, because uh, there's not a lot of middle ground to be had between the two sides on this. For sure. Uh, yeah. And, and even with, you know, discussion of, of a legislative fix, uh, once this one gets turned down, that, that seems like a, a, a difficult compromise to reach. But uh, certainly an interesting conversation to be had. Um, Zach, any thoughts on that one or anything anything else uh, or Alethea on, on wrapping up the proposal conversation? No. Okay. So here we are. We're at a point where we're ready to take some, uh, some questions. Uh, I see that there is one in there. I would encourage uh, anybody to submit a question on that, uh, on that chat box. Uh, and actually, uh, I don't know if Zach or Alethea, you've taken a look at this, uh, Anthony's got a question on House District 22, um, and that is the uh, Rep. Colazar and um, Naracher. It's a Wayne County seat. Any thoughts that uh, either of you have on that? Yeah, so Rep. Colazar is um, an incumbent, and he, his district did get a little bit tougher with redistricting, um, but Republicans are not you know, really making that strong of a push here. I think they think that Rep. Colazar is you know, a little bit too strong for them to really be able to make a play and there's so many other seats um you know that that are really on the radar this year that i i don't see you know anything happening here rep colazar should be should be good he you know is a, a seasoned campaigner he's won you know tough seats um you know he's he's doing everything he needs to do outstanding uh and then mary's got a question about uh, voting turnout uh uh, percent, what do you think the turnout will be, percent voting, and what absentee uh, percentage? Uh, and we've already got some information on uh, absentee ballots requested already, I think, is, a, is something that uh, is, is, was known as of last week. What are your thoughts on those? Well, I mean, right now, as of last week, and we'll get new information today, one and a half million absentee ballots have been requested. So, that would be on pace to exceed what happened in 2018. 2018, if I recall, the total number of votes cast for governor was about 4.25 million. That was a huge midterm turnout. Um, of course, it's possible to exceed that. Um, you know, we had, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of what five some million votes cast for president. Uh, so, you know, it's certainly possible turnout could be higher than 2018, um, but probably not by that much. Uh, it was that was a massive turnout in 2018. The big difference would be, I think, there was a you know, Republican, a bit of a malaise in the Republican base in 2018. I don't think that's going to be the case this year. They're likely to be out in force, um, and it appears Democrats should be out pretty strongly as well. So I would expect a very, very big turnout. Um, I think one question will be uh, absentee ballots. Are those going to be somewhere on the order of 40 to 50 percent of all ballots cast again? Or is it more like one third to 40 percent? No way to know yet. Uh, if it ends up being about one and a half million, that suggests fewer people will vote absentee this time than in 2020 from a percentage standpoint. 
but there's a lot of time yet for people to ask for to have an absentee ballot sent to them. Outstanding. Um, and then just one other question I had, and, and this is more of a political environment type question is, I, as we've talked about through all these races, there's a lot of things that are shading the conversation, but I don't ever recall a political environment similar to this one where you've got, you know, abortion economy is the top issues, you've got new district lines. Uh, and I think it all goes together to say this is uh, a little bit of organized chaos uh, going on in the state of Michigan. Do you ever recall an environment like this or, or anything uh, in your research to, to come close to what we're encountering right now? I don't. Um, you, you listed them out very well. And, you know, it just throw in the usual dynamics, too, where you have uh, the president's party usually does poorly in the midterms. That in this case would be the Democrats, but you have a Democratic incumbent governor, and usually incumbent governors do very, and their party do very well when they run for re-election. Um, so you know, throw that into the mix as well, and it, it adds to a, you know a pretty unpredictable situation, especially with it looking good for the Democrats at the top of the ticket, but the Republicans pouring money you know down the ticket. So um, it's I, I haven't seen anything like it. Uh, it'll be interesting for sure. And looking, like I said, looking forward to seeing the, the Wednesday morning write up from Gong War on how things went. Well, and to that point, uh, do you think we'll know Wednesday morning uh, all the results or, or, or the bulk of the results to be able to determine control of the House or the Senate? Uh, you know, probably not. I would say I am not an optimist. <laughs> I think, too, we're going to have so many close races that you know, we're probably just not going to be ready to call a lot of them. We do have the two days of pre-processing to help clerks, you know, with the, the absentee ballots if there are more of those. Uh, but, you know, it's tough in some of these areas, to, especially when the races are close to, to know for sure um, the next day. But, you know, it's good that a lot that Kent County has some key seats because they do a pretty good job. But downriver, we might not know until, you know, later Wednesday morning. Uh, it'd be great if you could do, uh, if the Gong War team could do before and after picks of, you know, the close of the polls at eight o'clock, how you look at that point versus four <laughs> o'clock, six o'clock in the morning on Wednesday morning to see how you're doing and if you've got any hair left or, or how much coffee you've drank to get to that point. But uh, in order to keep this to an hour, I think it's a good time to, to wrap that up. Um, talk a little bit of business at this point. Uh, as I mentioned earlier at the top of the program, uh, Gongwer and Plunkett Cooney are teaming up to co-sponsor uh, the Pick the Winners contest for the November 8th general election. Uh, just a word of caution, though, about the contest. You're going to need to expand some brain power when making your selections on a blend of state and federal race races, plus the ballot initiatives. There's going to be gift cards to the top three contestants. And in order to not violate campaign finance or lobby disclosure laws, lobbyable officials, registered lobbyists, and journalists are not going to be eligible for gift cards. Uh, please note the contest ends promptly when the polls close at 8 p.m. on Tuesday, November 8th. Uh, so please sign up for that. Uh, look forward to seeing how everybody does. Uh, and then at the conclusion of this webinar, you'll receive a pop-up survey that also includes a link to the Pick the Winners contest survey. Of course, we'd appreciate your feedback about today's program. Please feel free to provide that to us and get busy filling out your contest survey. Uh, look forward to seeing those results. In case you or a colleague would like to review a recording of today's session, you can do so by visiting our event page under the insights link on Plunkett Cooney's website at www.plunkettcooney.com. A link to the recording should be available on that page later today or tomorrow. Uh, that concludes our program today. Uh, on behalf of today's presenters from Gongwar News Service, Zach Gorchow, Alethea Kasman, and Ben Solis, and the member of, members of Plunkett Cooney's Government Relations Practice Group, thank you for attending the webinar, and good luck picking the general election winners. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.